my contribution to this workshop, which aspires to elucidate the subliminal, societal, economic, and other factors underlying technological change in pottery production, focuses on the paradigm of the Cypriot ceramic industry during the transition from the 13th to the 12th centuries BC. Cyprus presents a particular case on a Mediterranean level with regards to the persistence of handmade forms, the temporal introduction of the fast wheel technology, and the dynamic processes by which it was established. Amidst an otherwise critical era for the Eastern Mediterranean, Cypriot ceramic production endorsed the efficiencies presented by the potter's wheel for the first time at such a widespread scale. This seeming paradox will be examined in detail in my presentation today. For the purposes of elucidating the late Cypriot production of fine wares during the 13th to the 12th century BC transition, my contribution will focus on the material remains unearthed within the Paphos catchment area that includes the Polity's urban center, known as Palepaphos, and the short-lived settlement of Ma Paleogastro. However, the evidence from other pertinent sites in Cyprus will be also brought into the picture for a comprehensive and holistic approach. In order to attain the challenging task of untangling the ceramic transformations characterizing the island at the close of the Late Bronze Age, it is a prerequisite that we take a macrohistoric and contextual view of Cyprus from within. Cyprus emerged as a significant component within the Eastern Mediterranean trade network only by the end of the Middle Bronze Age at around the middle of the 17th century BC. During this transformative era, the island settlement pattern underwent substantial changes to accommodate the needs of an incipient economic basis. The emergent economic order centered on the procurement of copper and the metal's extra-insular transshipment to other Mediterranean regions. The foundation of new settlements by or near the coast, acting as gateway centers, epitomizes these transformations. During the course of the Late Bronze Age, such settlements developed urban characteristics and functioned as the administrative centerpieces in charge of an extended periphery. The distribution of the cupriferous formations, which marked the lifeblood of the Cypriot economy around the Trothers Mountain, you can see this in pink, did not encourage the consolidation of a robust island-wide authority. Indeed, the extant archaeological remains present unequivocal evidence for the political segmentation of the island into a series of distinct political entities. No sooner had the young late Cypriot polities established their political and economic domains than crisis hit. By the cumulative term Mediterranean-wide crisis, we denote the series of events that generally speaking, correspond to the eradication of the palace-based polities in the Aegean, Anatolia, and part of the Silo-Palestinian coast, the succumbing of Egypt into decline and the breakdown of the overtly centralized economic trading system. This spectacular system's collapse did not leave Cyprus unaffected. Considering how the economic florid of the late Cypriot polities relied heavily on the external demand for the island's metalliferous wealth, the devolution of several of the land-based political authorities in the Eastern Mediterranean, and the disintegration of the Late Bronze Age intricate economic stru structure had a pronounced effect on the island. However, as a result of Cyprus's segmented politeconomic landscape and the apparent absence of a strong central state, the turbulent events of circa 1200 BC impacted differently on each of the regional late Cypriot polities. The abandonment of the primary urban centers at Maroni Vurnes and Calabasos Ayos Dimitrios by the end of the 13th century and that of Alasa Taverna during the course of the 12th epitomizes the effect of the Mediterranean-wide economic breakdown on Cyprus. Evidently, the curtailment of external demand for Cypriot copper resulted in the disintegration of this neighboring polity's economic fabric and brought about their conscious abandonment. Despite the apparent decrease in the number of the late Cypriot urban centers, the 12th century horizon in Cyprus 
does not correspond to a breakdown of urbanism or the collapse of the island's idiosyncratic political structure. Continuity within the urban environment of the late Cypriot polities is evidence at the quayside of Engomi on the eastern coast, coast, which persisted following a destruction episode, at Halasultan Teke and Kition on the southeastern coast, and at Palepafos on the southwestern. For the settlements of Kition and Palepafos, the 12th century horizon corresponds to a period of unprecedented flourishment. The political authorities of Kidion and Palepafos, enhanced by the abandonment of the territorial polities in between them and empowered by population movements, reached an unprecedented level of flourishing, which is expressed by the construction of the first truly monumental edifices on the island. The settlement of Mapaleogastro, which will feature extensively in my talk today, was founded from scratch during the turbulent years of around 1200 BC within the Bafos region. The settlement was extremely short-lived, persisting for merely a couple of generations before its eventual abandonment by the middle of the 12th century BC. Mapaleogastro is often grouped with Pilagokinokremos, situated on the southwestern coast of the island, despite significant differences in their material culture. Both have been considered as the fortified establishments of Aegean immigrants who fled the destructions in the Greek mainland and settled in Cyprus. However, as the indicators themselves indicate, as the excavators themselves indicate, sorry, the material culture of Ma is comparable in many respects to that of other late Cypriot sites. And I have a long quote from um, Ma's publication. More importantly, uh, both Pila and Ma lack any vital cultural indicators such as texts, burials, or cult centers, which might have determined an immigrant population's cultural baggage. The establishment of the highly organized settlement at Ma Paleocastro, with a plethora of imported artifacts and indications of copper processing activities, undoubtedly necessitated large investment of wealth for the construction of communal works, such as the fortification walls. The closest urban center to Mapaleogastro is situated in the modern uh, day village of Kuklia, the area that accommodated the administrative nucleus of the Paphian polity. There are pronounced regional idiosyncrasies that are shared between the material remains of the Paphian urban center and Ma, but it is nonetheless extremely challenging to elucidate the character of such connections and to conclusively assert whether these extended to the political sphere. Evidently, the breakdown of the late Bronze Age economic order at the close of the 13th century BC evoked a variable impact on the island's territorial polities, some of which were destroyed, others abandoned, while others flourished. The Cypriot coastal emporia that made it unscathed into the 12th century BC partook in the decentralized commercial strategies that characterized the Mediterranean following the devolution of the strictly organized state-level trade. The post-crisis period in Cyprus induces a remarkable level of continuity in the island's political and economic structure, most profoundly displayed by the uninterrupted use of the Cypromenoan script the indigenous scribal tool of the Late Bronze Age. The critical years of around 1200 BC in Cyprus also mark a phase of internal and external migration episodes, which nonetheless remain largely invisible in the archaeological record. However, the presence of relocated populations from the Aegean in particular within the 12th century milieu becomes unequivocal when considering that the island's readable texts in the first millennium BC record a dialectal form of Greek that bears kingship to that recorded in the Mycenaean texts. This language change corroborates in retrospect the establishment of Greek-speaking populations on the island at the close of the Late Bronze Age. In addition to the restructuring of Cyprus's settlement pattern, the transition from the 13th to the 12th century BC coincides with a period of transformations in the island's material culture, best seen in the ceramic industry, and specifically with regards to the production of fire, fine wares. 
this transformative period saw the gradual abandonment of the two centuries old late Cypriot handmade wares that are known as beige ring and white slipwear, and the eventual establishment of a Wilmet fineware class that largely follows Aegean prototypes. It was not as simple as that with the click of a button. The elucidation of this dynamic transformation is at the core of my presentation today. Base ring and white slip wear vessels comprise the hallmark and trademark of late Cypriot ceramic finewares. They are characterized by a remarkably long production spanning from the dawn of the late Bronze Age until approximately the end of the 12th century BC, continuing from older, well-established um, types. The manufacture of base ring wear vessels in particular insinuates an advanced level of, te of technical attainment and know-how. <coughs> Macroscopic and scientific analysis on the wear have shown the thorough settling and cleaning procedures undertaken by the potters to produce the extremely fine fabric that as a rule characterizes the ceramic class. Base ring wear vessels were, as a, again, as a general rule, handmade, in that both primary and secondary forming were carried out without the use of rotative kinetic energy. The traces of the potter's fingers used to shape the vessel's form or attach the neck and base of closed vessels are often visible on the inside surface. Explicit traces on the surfaces of base ring vessels, however, denote the limited use of turntables for secondary forming procedures, such as scraping and smoothing, and occasionally also for the compaction of the vessel surfaces for reducing wall width or the fashioning of bases and rims. Particular morphological features of base ring wear jugs and jacklets entail the application of, of plugs made of dried clay, and you can maybe see the similarity, for the attachment of vertical handles. These are only visible from the inside of closed vessels. Most of the base ring uh, vessels were slipped and additionally burnished or polished, attaining a high degree of reflective surface luster. The recording of visibly vitrified specimens suggests that base ring vessels were fired in high temperatures that exceed the threshold of around 800 degrees Celsius. A characteristic attribute of base ring vessels is their consistent hardness achieved by their thin walls, very uh, refined clay, and controlled firing atmosphere. They have a hardness of about five in Moss's scale, while some examples can reach up to seven, which is very, very hard. Base ring uh, vessels are also characterized by a metallic texture and a distinctive ching. They also often feature morphological details that would make sense in metallic vessels, but have absolutely no use in clay forms, such as the depiction of fake nails for the attachment of handles, and also loops, again, for the attachment of handles. That will make sense in a, in a, in a bronze vessel, not in, 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 in a clay form. So this would suggest that base ring vessels were emulating metallic prototypes, such as this very rare example of a bronze ball that was found inside a tomb at Engomi. The complex but relatively uniform decorative and morphological homogeneity of base ring wear vessels, as well as their intricate manufacture technique and firing procedures, strongly insinuate that base ring wear vessels were produced at a rather, at a rather limited number of regional centers by specialist craftsmen. During the course of the 12th century BC, the centuries-old base ring and white slip wares deteriorated dramatically in quantitative terms. At the same time, decorated fine wares of Wilmot manufacture, which largely, though not exclusively, draw inspiration from the Mycenaean production of the Aegean, were gradually established as the island's principal tableware pottery. This wear has been associated with an abundance of complex and arbitrary terminology, such as Mycenaean 3C1B, a term that has been proven highly problematic, imposing interpretative frameworks and bearing historically biased connotations. 
Most scholars today opt for the term white painted wheelmate three wear when referring to the production of wheelmate fine wares in the 13th and 12th centuries BC in Cyprus, a terminology that despite its many flaws, tests to become universal. And here I show you an example of the terminology that has been used for the exact same, oop, for the exact same vessels um, over the years, so a very problematic um, issue, terminology. Aegean-style finewares bear salient indications for the use of a high-speed rotational device which utilizes rotative kinetic energy to raise the vessel's walls, fashion its form, and expedite further modifications. The vessel's surfaces denote the employment of the wheel-throwing technique, although these have been microscopically perceived and further research is necessitated, is necessitated to determine whether some vessels were manufactured using a combination of wheel-fashioning modes, especially for the larger specimens. Fast wheel technology was not newly introduced on the island at this time. Evidence of potter utilizing a rotational device for the shaping and possibly also throwing of vessels is attested from the early part of the Late Bronze Age at around the middle of the 17th century BC onwards. However, the predominance of Aegean style finewares during the course of the 12th century BC coincides with the increasingly widespread use and eventual establishment of Wilma technology on the island. Aegean-style wheelmade ceramics, locally produced in Cyprus, pre present an abundance of different fabrics. The occurrence of multiple production centers has been corroborated by extensive scientific analysis, including the most recent ones by Mount Joe and Momsen. Wheelmade finewares of Aegean style are generally distinguished by light colored clays, mostly light orange brown, slip of a similar or lighter color, and painted decoration that spans from red to brown to black. Again, as a general rule, the slip and color of Aegean style finewares is matte, which sets them apart from the lustrous slip and paint that characterizes the ceramic production in the Greek mainland. Though this concept stands true for most cases, it is sometimes exceedingly difficult to distinguish between the two spheres of production as the variations in quality and execution of the painted decoration from both areas proliferate. The clay of these uh, fine wares is well levigated, but, I, but again their fabric ranges from fine, from very fine, to porous with several small, tiny and subangular inclusions and voids, to powdery or chalky. Compared to the extremely high fire base ring wear, Aegean style pottery is classified at two to three in Moss's scale. The series of events that resulted in the eventual overthrow of the handmade fine wares and the establishment of Aegean style wheel made ceramics remain a much perplexed matter. In the early work of scholars dealing with the local production of Aegean style pottery in Cyprus, this phenomenon was considered to mark a dramatic shift and was quite simplistically equated to the presence of people uh, with Mycenaean origin residing on the island. While the migration of Greek-speaking populations in Cyprus during the 12th century BC can be corroborated as we have seen retrospectively by the shift in the island's language, the association between the establishment of Aegean populations on the island and the very dynamic transformations characterizing Cyprus's ceramic industry cannot be straightforwardly or linearly linked. Taking a macro-historic and contextual view in our attempts to elucidate the transformations of Cyprus's ceramic industry at the close of the Late Bronze Age, we ought to start from the earlier part of the period. During the course of the 15th century BC, and mostly during the 14th and early 13th centuries, the Cypriots became exceedingly fond of Mycenaean pottery. Mycenaean vessels are found by the hundreds on the island, deposited in their vast majority in mortuary contexts. Mycenaean craters of both the bell and mostly the amphoroid type were a favorable shape. As an essential gadget for feasting activities, Mycenaean craters with their exceptionally lustrous paint, exotic origin, and impressive pictorial scenes promoted and enhanced the owner's social prominence during um, feasting activities or, or other social gatherings. 
From as early as the late uh, 15th and early 14th centuries BC, ceramic forms that typify the Mycenaean sphere were being locally produced in Cyprus, albeit in a limited range and quantity. Of the earliest Mycenaean forms reproduced locally in Cyprus are the small scale and miniature 300 piriform jars. Locally made piriform jars are typified by a distinctive fabric and a characteristic <laughs> decorative treatment that comprises short stem spirals. Other Mycenaean shapes that were introduced in the local ceramic production in the late 14th, early um, 13th century BC, and so before any postulated Mycenaean exodus to the island, are pictorial craters of the amphoroid or the bell type decorated in a distinctive fashion that was termed rude style. This designation was used to denote the inferiority in the quality of such craters when compared to the production of the Greek mainland. This pottery class is also known as the pastoral style owing to the thematics portrayed, uh, which feature bulls and other animals. During the course of the 13th century BC, the corpus of locally made Wilmot uh, vessels of Aegean inspiration augments. New shapes include shallow balls of varying, of varying forms and handled types, as well as a limited range of closed vessels such as jugs and stirrup jars. The production of Aegean-style wheel-made ceramics on the island witnesses an exponential increase by the end of the 13th and the inception of the 12th century BC at the expense of the traditional production of the handmade base ring and white slip wares. In the course of the 12th century BC, the deep bowl, that is occasionally referred to as a skiffos, was established as the open shape par excellence within the sequence of tableware pottery. The deep bowl is typified by a bell-shaped body with two horizontal loop handles that flank linear or more elaborate compositions. This shape was introduced already during the close of the 13th century BC, but in very, in very small uh, numbers and in rather awkward forms. In addition to the marked rise in the popularity of Aegean-style finewares during the course of the 12th century BC, there was also an augmentation of the repertoire of shapes that included amphorae, strainer jars, kyliches, mugs, and, and others. And so by the end of the 12th century BC, the ceramic industry of the island was entirely transformed with the centuries-old production of handmade wares <coughs> completely overthrown and wheel-made fine wares of Aegean inspiration predominating. This brief outline serves to illustrate three important observations with regards to the transformed ceramic industry of Cyprus during the late 13th and um, early 12th century BC. First of all, that the prevalence of the wheel-made finewares in Cyprus was by no means abrupt. Secondly, that the production of handmade finewares was not ousted overnight. And thirdly, that the Aegean-style pottery was appropriated within the late Cypriot cultural milieu. At Mapa Leocastro, for instance, while Aegean-style wheel-made finewares predominate, the percentage of the handmade wares, and base ring in particular, is not negligible, amounting to 19% of the entire assemblage, you can see it in red, and 35 of the fineware corpus from the side. Evidence for the dynamic transformations and experimentation that characterizes the century-long period spanning the close of the 13th century to the end of the 12th is suggested by several specimens that illustrate the osmosis of shapes decorative patterns and techniques deriving from the Aegean and the local Cypriot production. The most comprehensive evidence illustrating these forceful processes was contained within two wells at the locality of Evredi, which is situated at the urban nucleus of the Paphian polity that are interpreted as the residue of residential and workshop activities. Bowl number 28 from Evredi Well 3 is an eloquent example of the dynamic nature of the Cypriot ceramic industry during the 13th to 12th century transition. The vessel follows the fabric and wheelmate technique of the Aegean style vessels, but it is shaped and decorated as a wide slip ware. 
the, vessels, the, the wells contain additional vessels unveiling the integration of wide slip elements in the repertoire of the geonized Wilmette finewares. Another ball, number 199, also depicts the amalgamation between the Aegean and the Cypriot spheres of pottery production. It represents the wheel-made version of a typical Y-shaped ball in basing shape. You have seen it several times. But in the characteristic fabric and manufactured technique of Aegean-style vessels. It is covered by a light brown wash, presumably to simulate the metallic texture of base ring vessels. Another example, number four, um, 14 from the Everdee Wells, is a hemispherical vessel with a lac handle attached on the rim, covered inside and outside with a thin uh, brown wash. The application of lac handles is a very peculiar feature for the ceramic repertoire of the Greek mainland, but it is very much in place within the late Cypriot ceramic industry, again illustrating the merging of the two worlds. And I show you here an example of a base ring, uh, a base ring vessel. Finally, another interesting example is a base, ring is a base fragment of a juglet from Evredi that was formed following a typical base ring shape, but was manufactured in the fabric and the decorative features of Aegean style finewares. But in this case, unlike other examples, it is handmade. In addition to its highly experimental character, the transformation of the island's ceramic industry betrays a remarkable level of regional variability. For instance, regional idiosyncrasies identified in the production of wheel-made finewares at Enkomi and related sites include the popularity of elaborately decorated surfaces, particularly on bell craters, strainer jugs, and stirrup jars, bearing intricate spiral decorations and densely filled metopes. By chromity in the production of white painted Wilmette III is a very rare feature. It is, however, be better represented in the uh, southeastern part of the island. The bichrome effect is achieved by the intentional application of black and reddish or orange paint on the same vessel, probably produced under the influence of the Levantine coast. Several shallow bowls with a bichrome effect were found at Gideon and uh, also at Pilago Kinokremos. A three-handle piriform jug for, from Halasultan Tseke is also decorated with a bichrome technique, the distinction between the two colors truly standing out. The area of Paphos uh, presents the largest array of regional idiosyncrasies in terms of the production of Aegean-style fanware ceramics. The popularity of solid dark paint on the interior of deep dope bowls is considered as a regional feature of southwestern Cyprus, with plentiful examples from the urban center at Palepaphos and also Mapa Leocastro. A shape that is particularly popular in the region of Paphos is the one-handled bowl, either with a conical or more commonly with an angular profile. And finally, reg um, regional, idios uh, regional idiosyncrasy of the Aegean style production in Paphos is the popularity of a, hemi a hemispherical type of bowl with a rounded base and a circular impression below. <laughs> Examples of this um, shape were found at various localities within the Palepaphos nucleus. Rounded bases typify white sleep bowls and it is not unlikely that this feature derives from the Cypriot tradition. The small circular um, intendation on the underside of the base is a novel feature that evidently reflects the potter's attempt to create a form of base for what was previously a baseless type of ball. Cyprus constitutes um, an idiosyncratic case as regards to the introduction and adoption of the potter's wheel. Some 1,000 years after it was introduced and or established in the neighboring regions, the potter's wheel was introduced in Cyprus at the dawn of the late Bronze Age at around 1650 BC. As a result of the interaction with mainland social customs and technology uh, and the efforts um, of incipient elite groups to partake to the established ideological networks of the Eastern Mediterranean, the wheel is introduced in, in the late Cypriot ceramic industry. 
Such elite urban-oriented behaviors included well-made Levantine-inspired vessels of plainware associated with emergent behaviors of social display, such as communal feasting activities. Even so, a very limited number of late Cypriot ceramic types, such as plain, bichrome, white painted, and red or black slipwares, were manufactured in both handmade and wheelmade forms, while the fine wares um, base ring and white slip that we have seen earlier persisted in their handmade manufacture throughout the period. Therefore, while the know-how of wheelmate technology was instated on the island from as early as the 17th century BC, the production of Cypriot finewares continued to largely defy the convenience afforded by this technique for a good fourth century period. The persistence to handmade manufacture is accounted for neither ignorance nor conservatism on behalf of the Cypriot potters. The production of base ring and white slip vessels was a highly successful industry that was sustained by both internal and external demand. Evidently, the handmade production went hand in hand with the centuries-old late Cypriot finewares, which were deeply embedded in the island's social identity and practices. As indicated by Sarah Vaughan's detailed study of base ring wear, the plasticity of the clay used in the production of base ring vessels made it impossible to withstand the, the centrifugal force of the Wilmer technique. What thus instigated the transformations observed in the late Cypriot ceramic industry at this phase? I believe that our attempts to disentangle the late Cypriot ceramic industry amidst the crisis years should consider three parameters that cumulatively dictated its reorganization. First of all, the loss of the Mycenaean palaces at the end of the 13th century signified a major loss of the procurement of Mycenaean fineware ceramics, an essential apparel in the circles of Cypriot elites. The need to fill the void that was generated by the collapse of the Mycenaean political authorities may at least be partly responsible for the intensification of the local production of Aegean-style wares in Cyprus. Secondly, the destruction and abandonment of Ugarit and a, lot, and a number of other city-states in the northern Levantine coast signal a substantial market loss for the diffusion of late Cypriot handmade ceramics eastwards, again requiring from the, from the ceramic industry to adjust to this new era. And thirdly, the well-made character of this production agreed with the demands of the increasingly centralized urban centers of Cyprus in the 12th century BC. The gradual and eventual establishment of wheelmade ceramics during the course of the 12th century BC uh, corresponds to the transformed politico-economic landscape of the island and the empowerment of the urban centers by internal and external migration, mi migrations and the nucleation of economic and political dominion. Fast wheel technology, implicating full-time craft specialization and mass production, is befitting to the highly urbanized environment of the Cypriot polities in the 12th century BC. All three parameters combined ignited the substantial yet gradual transformation seen in the island ceramic industry at the course of the 12th century. Undoubtedly, the presence of people from the Greek mainland on the island, as is corroborated by the establishment of a Greek dialectal form, must have contributed to this end. With this, I certainly do not evoke the paradigm that was presented in past scholarship, whereby Mycenaeus imposed the production over the Cypriots. I merely wish to underscore how the lot of, it, of the Aegean economic at most migrants established in Cyprus must have certainly included specialized craftsmen. This work, workforce, which remains largely invisible in the material record, would have undoubtedly stimulated and enhanced the Cypriot ceramic production of wheelmade finewares. The establishment of a wheelmade ware as the predominant fineware of Cypriot pottery production marked an upsurge in the in industrialization and expediting of the island's ceramic craftsmanship. It was, however, neither the first nor the final step in this process. I consider that the earliest attempts towards that direction are presented at around the middle of the 15th century BC, 
When Cypriot potters abandoned the laborious and time-consuming application of relief decoration on base ring vessels and replaced the decorative treatment with the more efficient application of white paint to coin a similar effect. The second step is evidence with the more extensive use of the fast wheel, um, uh, of the fast wheel to produce simple balls of Aegean type during the transition from the 13th to the 12th centuries BC. Subsequently, the process advances with the establishment of the deep ball as the ultimate open shape in the 12th century BC. The establishment of the deep ball as the prevailing eating and drinking vessel to the detriment of the shallow balls with a variety of profiles is indicative of the forceful processes towards a more typified shape characterized in the late Cypriot ceramic industry during this period. Nonetheless, 12th century BC pottery making was still characterized, as we have seen, by experimentation and fluidity, constituting an amalgamation of shapes, decorative patterns, and techniques from the Aegean and the local repertoire. The process culminates only in the subsequent 11th century BC, with the establishment of a uniform production of finewares at an island-wide um, scale. This ware, known as proto-white painted, reveals the mastering of the wheel throwing technique and comprises the first truly standardized fineware class of the island. So to conclude, Cyprus con constitutes a profound paradigm of the need to contextualize transformations in material culture within a relevant social, political, and economic scheme and challenges the assumption that wheelmade technology rapidly or gradually replaces handmade production upon its introduction. The case of Cyprus indicates the idiosyncratic means by which technological achievements, such as the use of the fast wheel technology, were employed, and that innovative technologies are not always predictably or <laughs> linearly endorsed. The late Cypriot ceramic industry further exemplifies how handmade production does not equate to poor quality or lack of labor division. The proficiencies entailed in the production of base ring vessels insinuate extreme technological know-how and the employment of specialized workforce. A lot of work remains to be done to elucidate the transformed late Cypriot ceramic industry during the time of uh, the Mediterranean white crisis, and we must at all times keep an open mind considering the exciting results of ongoing fieldwork projects, the forthcoming publication of old excavations, and the dynamic prospects of the integration of interdisciplinary studies to that end. The case of Cyprus epitomizes how periods of crisis do not necessarily lead to the decay and instability of crafts, of crafts Considering that amidst an otherwise critical period for the entire Mediterranean, the Cypriot ceramic industry was transformed to endorse Wilma technology at a hitherto unprecedented extent. Thank you very much for your attention.